Hi, I'm Lee. Welcome to the channel. I hope you're having a lovely day. I'm a short, overweight, middle-aged white dude. I've got thinning brown hair, black gloss. I'm wearing a dark gray t-shirt, light gray hoodie. I'm sitting in my Tesla Model Y, and in this video, buckle up, we're going to get a bit nerdy. Um, so a few people have asked to see a little bit about how I film all this stuff. Now, I'm not going to cover everything because there's too much to cover in one video, and I'm going to be a little bit all over the place because there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but I want to try and focus a little bit on the camera setup that I use because I've actually started using a slightly different camera setup and I wanted to discuss that but before we get into the camera I do want to talk just briefly about audio because audio is I think almost just as if not more important than your video because so if you've watched some, a lot of YouTube I think you can get away with some pretty average footage as long as your audio and your story are good whereas you cannot get away with the most beautiful footage in the world but your audio is a bit meh so let me just give you a little bit of little bit of a rundown of, of how I, I do audio so there's tons of different options and, and depending on different situations you're going to use different options but the easiest way that I've found to, to, to capture audio um, while I'm in the car and so on is I use a wireless transmitter and receiver and a lavalier mic so um, a really important thing to understand about audio is you want to always get your microphone as close as possible to the source of the audio that you're capturing. In this case, the, the source of the audio is my mouth. So a lot of YouTubers um, will use, you'll see a lot of these around, this is the Rode Wireless Go 2 uh, wireless transmitter and setup. Really cool, really easy, oh, really easy to use, but I want to add a little caveat to a few of those. What you see a lot of people doing is it's got a clip on, so they'll just clip the microphone onto themselves like this and talk like this. Look, it's better than using the microphone that's on your camera, but the challenge with this is this is actually too close to the source of the audio. And I, I blame Rode for this because they put a clip on it, so it makes people think that you should just clip it onto the front of your shirt. Um, what you want to do in terms of distance with microphone from your mouth is make the little aloha symbol, have your thumb on your bottom lip, and then wherever your pinky lands on your chest, that's where you want your microphone to be. So you actually want to clip this about here. And that's the ideal setup. Going a step further is you might want to get a lavalier microphone, which is something like this. And then you plug the lavalier microphone into the wireless system and have this taped on the inside of your shirt. So it's a little bit hidden. And that way no one can see the microphone, but they can hear you really well. In fact, that's exactly what I've got set up like that. So I've got a, a microphone taped to my the inside of my shirt just here and if I do the little hello thing you can see it's right there and then that's going to this wireless transmitter which is then going to the camera there. So that is how I'm capturing the audio. Now there's loads of tricks in terms of how to hide a microphone and avoid the clothing rustle noise and all that kind of stuff. I'll cover that in another video if people are interested. Let me know down in the comments. Um, but that's kind of what I wanted to cover in terms of microphones. Now, you might also be wondering what lavalier microphone I've got there. And that brings me on to the topic of gear and the cost of gear. Now, I do this for a living. So I run a film production company. So I've got a lot of this gear anyway because I use it for work. But when I was starting out, I didn't. So when I was starting out, I bought like, you know, $10, $20, $50 lavalier microphones. And as I got better with my skills and as I was making more money and could invest that back into gear, I got better gear. So don't stress that you can't use the same gear that I'm using because I do this for a living. So I can afford to buy this for my business. Like the lavalier microphone that I've got here that I'm wearing at the moment is a Sankin Cost 11, which is like a five, six hundred dollar microphone. Totally worth it, but you don't have to spend that kind of money just yet. Wait a bit until you're making some before you go ahead and spend it. So that's audio. Now, let's get on to cameras. And I, I'm going to sort of assume that you know nothing about cameras. So forgive me if I'm telling some people how to suck eggs and you're already familiar with all the stuff, but I'll try and explain a little bit, but not explain too much hopefully so a lot of people will use gopros which is perfectly fine and i use them in some cases but in terms of filming myself you don't get that nice shallow depth of field which means i'm in focus and the background is out of focus with a gopro you you can sort of get it but in order to get it you've got to have the thing that's in focus like really really close to the camera which 
well, that's just not a safe way to drive if I had the camera there, is it? Also, you don't want to see that close to me. At, no, I'm not going to do it. You get the idea. So GoPros can work if you need to, but it's better and it's going to look better if you can get a bigger camera with a bigger sensor in particular and, and adjustable lenses and things like that, if you can. So what I was using um, when I first started was the Sony a7S Mark III and I would have that tucked into the corner of sort of where this camera is now. Um, but one of the challenges was I had to have it upside down because there's only one connection point on the a7 III. Now you could put the a7 III in a cage which is what I would do sometimes, and that then gives you loads of other connection points. Obviously, you, you lock that in, but even when it's locked in here, it's not solid, solid, like there is a little bit of give, and you definitely want your cameras to be as locked in as possible when you're filming in a car, because the car is going to be bouncing up and down a little bit, and you can't prevent the bouncing, but you want the camera to bounce with the car. So if the car's going up like this, the camera needs to go up and down like this. Whereas if the car's going up and then the camera's like wiggle, 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 wiggle it's going to look a lot more wiggly on the cam on the camera, like on the footage. So you want your camera to be locked in nice and solid. But that was working quite well. So I had my A7S down there on a fairly wide lens because I wanted to capture as much as I could. And then I had another camera suction mounted to the ceiling of the car and that was looking at the screen of the car to show you what's happening on the screen. The challenge there for me is I don't want to I don't want cameras to see other cameras. Like I don't want you I don't want you as the audience to ever see a camera. So sometimes you will and that just can't be helped because another thing to keep in mind is when I'm working on my day job productions I've normally got a crew that I'm working with. So I've got, you know, sound recordists, lighting people, camera operators, camera assistants sometimes, a producer, a director, and very, or very often I'm the producer or the director and I'm not the talent. So I don't have to focus on all those things. I've got other people who can focus on things as well. For this YouTube stuff, most of the time I'm just doing it myself or maybe sometimes Simon or another friend is coming to help me out. So be kind to yourself and realize that you can't do everything that a whole team can do and you do what you can. So I do just want to put that out there. Where was I? Camera in the back. Yes. So that camera, because I don't want this camera to see that camera and this camera is fairly wide because the composition sort of comes out to the chair, or even I'm looking there now a little bit further back. I needed that camera in the back to be on quite a long zoom lens to go onto the screen to be able to see the screen but not be seen by that camera. So that would be on a 70 to 200 and that would be just out of shot and I'd actually have the lens connected and the camera connected and that would actually give me two connection points because the way to have your camera sitting as solid as possible is to have as many connection points as possible on the camera because the more connection points the more solidly it's connected to what it's connected to. Then with those two cameras, I needed to see what the cameras were seeing while I'm in the driver's seat because now the position of the sun doesn't change dramatically while I'm filming. Hopefully I don't film for that long, but if I'm driving the car, I might turn a corner and the sun was behind the car and that's fine. So this area is dark, but now I've turned around 180 degrees and now the sun's blaring in here and I'm much brighter. And so I may have to change settings on the camera. So what I actually had is two really long HDMI cables coming to the uh, cup holders. And I had each camera plugged into one of these, which is a Atomos, Ninja 5 um, monitor and this would show me what is happening on those cameras so I could see what was happening in real time and adjust it. This also records ProRes, I'm not going to get into that but cool little bits of kit. Not the best made, it'd be nice if there was a bit more metally than plastic but still they get the job done and they've yet to let me down dramatically. So that was that. So that's how I had it set up like that which worked okay until I had to go on a long road. Oh, actually, before I do, one other thing I want to talk about is camera stabilization. So a lot of cameras today will have built-in stabilization, which I, the idea is if you're walking around with the camera, you're doing this, and the camera will try and stabilize that so it doesn't look as bumpy. There are actually times where you want to switch that off. Mm. Maybe I'm sure you probably knew that, but just in case you didn't, here's why. So if 
and this I'll use the GoPro as an example. So GoPro's got really good built-in stabilization, but there's times when you want it switched off. So if I've got the GoPro attached to the outside of the car and it's facing outside that way and I'm filming a car driving past me, I want to have the stabilization turned on. So that it is stabilizing the shot because the thing that I'm filming is not connected to the camera. But on the other hand, if I had the camera set up like this, well, like this, on the side here, and I'm filming a section of my car driving along, so the camera is connected to the thing that it's filming, turn the stabilization off. Because otherwise, the camera is bumping around, and the thing that's connected to is bumping the same way, and the camera is trying to stabilize, so it's actually going to make your car look like it's wobbly because it, it doesn't know what it's doing it gets confused. So if you are filming something with like a GoPro or something that's got stabilization, but the GoPro is attached to the thing that's being stabilized and the GoPro is filming the thing that is stabilized, you want the GoPro to not try and stabilize because you want the GoPro to move in sync with the thing that it's filming that it's attached to. I hope that makes sense. I've, I've tried to put some B-roll on top of this to sort of help make that clearer, but hopefully that makes sense. So what's changed? The challenge was when I wanted to do long drives and the reason for that is you know obviously battery life is different but also um, if I'm doing a long drive there's a lot of times when I'm not filming anything I'm just driving and then I want to turn the cameras on like five minutes before I get to a charge or something like that to go oh we're now five minutes out from Wodonga and here's what's going on blah 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 blah. Um, so I could pull over and reach over and turn that on and reach, do some yoga and turn that on and turn everything on and get everything going, which you kind of need to do anyway. But, but then I've got to, you know, recalibrate things. It's not safe to do it while I'm driving, obviously, because it's just not. Um, so what I did when I did my first long road trip from Melbourne to Sydney and back is I only used GoPros. I didn't use my nicer, fancier cameras. And so I had one GoPro looking out the front of the car. I had another GoPro um, set up on a mount like, oh, hello. I had another GoPro set up on a mount like this. So I had like that, like there, filming me there. And then I had another one going out like that. And again, because I'm really pedantic about, I don't want cameras to see cameras. And here's another sort of drawback of GoPros is even in the most narrow field, the GoPro's angle is really wide. So if I had a GoPro here, it could see if I had a camera coming down from here like this, you'd see the pole. And I know most people are like, dude, just who cares? I do. These are the things that are important to me. So what I actually did on that is, yeah, GoPro out front, GoPro down there, and to hide the GoPro that was looking at the screen from this GoPro is I actually had this clip thing, ow, that's really tight, clipped onto my center column, and then I had these arms, and I had the GoPro up like this, like this, and it was wobbly as a wobbly thing, and it, it worked, but it, it wasn't the best setup, like, well, actually, with GoPros, it probably is the best setup with GoPros, but I thought, there has to be a better way, I just, there's got to be a way to, to get the better quality footage, and, and, yeah, find a way to do it, so I was chatting to a mate of mine, who is a photographer and he was a, a Panasonic ambassador at the time and he was always like hey you should use Panasonic you should use Panasonic and I'm not fussed sort of what what gear I use and I was mentioning this this challenge that I was having to him and he said have you heard of this particular camera that Panasonic made and no I hadn't heard of it so I had a look and this is the camera well this is one of the cameras that he suggested so this is the Lumix BS1H now this is the full frame version they make a um, micro four thirds version which is a smaller sensor now sensor size is really important when it comes to cameras so one of the challenges with the GoPros is because it's got such a small sensor it's not that great in low light because the sensor is only so big to let the light in and capture the light so you want bigger sensor bigger light various different other things so this is a full frame sensor, so a really great sensor. In terms of specs, really fantastic. It'll go, I think it'll do all the way up to 6K or 5, 5.3, 5.7 or 6K. I think I'll put it up here, some, some, some details. No, I'll put some details here about all the specs and all the stuff that, that it, in terms of how high it can shoot and all that kind of stuff. Really important is that it does capture 10-bit footage. Now, 
I'll try not to nerd too much about it, but effectively cameras these days will either shoot 8-bit or 10-bit or 8-bit and 10-bit. And ideally you want to capture 10-bit if you can. If you can't, it's not a big deal. Up until four or five years ago, most of us were capturing in 10-bit, sorry, in 8-bit, and it was perfectly fine. But now that we can capture in 10-bit, and most cameras do capture 10-bit, those two extra bits really make a difference. And it's not just two. So you're not going from eight to 10, it's exponential. So eight bit is this many colors and 10 bit is that many colors, which means you're capturing a lot more color. So when you're going from, let's say you're looking at a blue sky and it's going from dark blue to light blue, the more bits you've captured, the smoother that gradation will be between um, the blue and you won't get what's called um, Oh, my brain just went uh, completely blank, but I'll put some footage up here, maybe if I can find some of what it looks like. We've almost like looks like a line of blue, a line of the shade of blue, a line of that shade of blue, a line. Of, so it it looks blocky and it more bits smoother. Not essentially, you can still get that smoothness with eight bit, but you have to expose really well. I'm going to stop going down that nerdy rat hole. Um, but another cool feature, obviously, look at the size of it. It's tiny. <coughs> that's a good thing and a bad thing. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, also, it's got connection points all around. I like me connection points all around. In fact, the camera that's filming me right now, you can see that I've mounted it on the top and on the side. And having those two connection points means that that camera is really solidly in there. When the car bounces, the camera bounces in line with the car. So that that's really what you're after in terms of having it re I mean, I'd have a third one if I could, but just the position doesn't make sense. So having those connection points, really cool. Um, battery life on this is really good. Like I think I tested it and it got to about two to three hours just on a single charge recording, which is pretty darn good. By the way, I'm not recording in 6K. I think that's, excuse me, a little bit of overkill. So I just shoot 4K, 10 bit, 25 frames per second, that's all we need. In fact, it's probably more than I need, but I go for that as a minimum. Um, two card slots, which is helpful so that if you, you know, uh, go over whatever, cameras having two card slots is really cool. It's got all the connections you could want. So time code is really handy. So again, most people are not going to use time code, but basically time code is a way that you can sync up your cameras and you've got like an atomic clock i'm exaggerating there but it's like an atomic clock going to both cameras and so the cameras are completely in sync and when you mix when you put them together in 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 the edit bay you just you know you sync them right away which is great um the first little caveat that you'll see is there's no screen so how do you see what the camera is seeing so you definitely need one of these monitors Here's one of the challenges, I'm going to put this up on the screen to show you what this camera is seeing, is that you get the menu stuff on the screen, which is less than ideal. Now you can hide that. You can also bring up this quick menu option, and that then allows you to go in and make sort of what changes you want over there on the right-hand side. But it'd be nice if you could bring up the quick menu without seeing the display stuff. Not the worst thing in the world but it just it would be nice but this then doesn't really fix the problem as such because i've still got to have the monitor plugged into the camera to control it ah but do i so let's turn this one off for a moment and let me show you the real um party piece the thing that really got me excited about this camera and the reason why i wanted to use this camera for the setup so over here is my laptop and you can see there and I'll, now that I've shown you what's going on on the laptop I can sort of put this away because I'm capturing on my laptop screen and I can show you how this all works because I've got the BS1H that's filming me here simply connected via a USB-C cable to my laptop and I'm controlling the camera entirely from the laptop so you can see here that with this Lumix app I've got complete control of the camera, so I can stop and stop the recording. I won't stop because then you won't hear what I'm saying. Um, but I can adjust my aperture on the camera so I can make it darker or brighter or brighter or darker, whatever I need with the camera. I can change my shutter speed to really go nutsoid on that. Let's just go back to 
180, which is what it should be. And I can even change my recording format. Now, it won't let me do this whilst I'm recording, but you get the basic idea. And you can see here, there's all the recording formats all the way up to um, 6K there, which is 4 to 10 bit. Yep, so you've got all, the, all of those settings. And how do I get out of that one? I'm not quite sure. Let me just click somewhere on, probably just click on the one that I've got. Yep. Um, I've got my white balance. I can change autofocus. I can change my video style. I wonder if that'll let me do it while I'm filming. Oh, wow. It lets me do it while I'm filming. That's good and bad. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, okay. No, I, just, I think it just let me preview that. It won't let me change it to set it. So, yep. So you can see here that I can preview the camera i can stop and stop the recording in fact i even think there's an option somewhere here where i can put the camera to sleep which is pretty cool and you can also see there in the corner it shows me how much time i've got left on the memory card so you've really got a huge amount of control over the camera so this is really the big selling point for me of when I'm doing long drives, I can just leave the camera set up there. Now, between drives, if I've had, if I've got enough battery, so if a battery, let's say a battery lasts two hours, and that's with recording, so without recording, it probably lasts three, but let's say two. So let's say I'm doing a six, let's say, let's say an eight hour drive, that's four batteries, I mean, it's a fair few batteries, but I could just leave the camera switched on if I wanted to, and my laptop could be powered off of the car, and, just controlling it. Now, the other really cool thing is through this app, you can also control the camera via, well, not through the app, but basically you can control the camera via your phone as well. So I could actually have all of these settings on my phone. So I could just wirelessly control the camera. The one little caveat, and see, I'd love it if you could control multiple cameras with your phone because you can control multiple cameras with the computer. So I could have one camera set up here, one camera set up there. I could have another camera looking out the front of the car and I could start and stop the recording on all of them and change the settings on all of them just by having them all on my laptop. Now, it would be cool if I could do that from the phone, but from what I can tell, you can only control one camera at a time from the from from you know a wireless device. Of a wire. I wonder if it's, I don't know if it's, I'd imagine it's probably, it might be a bandwidth thing or whatever, but it would be cool if you could do, you know, multiple cameras from um, a wireless device, because then I wouldn't need to use my, my laptop. I could just use my phone or have a tablet sitting here on the side and they could control them. I could have two phones, but that's, again, a little bit extreme. Um, but really, this this controlling from the laptop, this is, this is really one of the big selling points. And to be fair... This is not just with the Lumix BS1H. This will work with any Lumix camera. So any of the newer Panasonic Lumix cameras, you could control multiples of them from your laptop um, over the cable, which is which is pretty cool. Um, it would be even cool if you could do it over Wi-Fi, but I understand that that may not be technically possible. So let me show you how I then set up the camera in the back. Um, and this is where I could go one of two ways. I could go with... Um, I could put a monitor on the camera just so I can see it while I'm setting it up. But it's actually quite handy having it on the laptop because while I'm looking at the laptop, I can switch between cameras and I can then move the camera at the back as far as I can. And I can see this camera so I can see when that camera comes into view of that camera and then move it slightly back to getting this all set up. We are now in the back of the car. Now I've adjusted the angle on that camera because you can see it's, it's, it's getting a bit more of here because normally we're sort of up until here. So I want to get the camera that's coming in here can't go past sort of this point. So I've already pre-attached the top of the camera to this three-way suction mount. Now this is um, a Delkin or Decklink. What's that? Delkin. This is a Delkin. I'll put links in the description of the of the of the video um, so you can see where all, all the gear came from. Um, so this is the one. So you want to get this set up sort of get the get the distance about right so it's probably needs to be about there to be out of the shot and so we go ahead and, and let's just get the second one in there so yeah we get those two suctioned in and then we get the third one now we need to adjust that a little bit yep and get the third arm suctioned in as well make a few little adjustments Yep, so 
that comes so the shot comes to about there so this should be out now normally i'd have that set up so i can see exactly the angle but i want you to see what i'm doing here so so it makes more sense i've got my laptop set up here so i can see what is happening and then um now here's the cool bit the fact that you can have multiple cameras set up at once so i've got this hdmi cable plugged into my laptop and there's the other end so i go ahead and plug that in here switch this camera on and yep, lens cap is off that's always a it's always a good idea and so that camera is now on and now on the software on the computer there's my second camera so that i want it visible and i can see both cameras at the same time which is really cool and so there is my screen so that is the shot that i want so let me go ahead and start tightening things here now one thing to that one thing i've noticed when you do tighten these as you tighten it lifts a little bit so always have it a little bit lower than where you plan to have it because as you tighten it it's going to kind of get pushed up a little bit there now that's nice and solid but and i've pushed the button again that's nice and solid but that's still quite wiggly so we need more suction mounts and more attachments so i've got my smaller ones that i'm going to attach to the side so these are the manfrotto um connection points and then i've got manfrotto little, little manfrotto arms so just make sure that they sort of reach where they need to reach to and actually let me do the side first so you can see what i'm doing so make sure that they reach the camera yep they'll reach the camera and what i do i don't know if this is the right way to do it or not but i aim for the connection point that's furthest away from that so the so the the, the connections so i wouldn't use the one on the top i'd use the one on the bottom so on and so forth now the way that these suction cups work is that you take the cu cover off and then you put it where you want to put it and then you just start pushing the blue tab and you'll see i don't know if you'll see it well enough but there's a little red marker here and as you're pushing that as the red marker goes down if the red marker is in the suction is enough if the red markers come out you need to suction it some more and these are always a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge to sometimes i get it like really quickly and sometimes it takes like forever to get the suction to, to sort of stick but the luck is with me and there we go so that is nice and solid and then we get that connection point into there tighten that up make sure we're happy with the angle before we tighten it i think i'm happy with that angle it's a little bit see i'd probably this this, this was the only these were the only lenses that um uh, panasonic by the way a big thank you to Panasonic Australia for loaning me these cameras so I could try this out. Um, these were the only lenses that were available um, when Panasonic loaned me them. So these are the 20 to 60s. They're, they're okay. Um, they're pretty good. Small and light, so so they, they do the job. But I'll discuss later sort of where I'm going with this, but I'd probably go with the 24 to 70s just to have that little, those extra 10 mils. And they're, they'd be a constant 2.8, so the aperture would be 2.8 the whole way through, whereas these are 3.5 to 5.6. So the more you zoom in, the lower the... the yeah, the aperture's not as much. Um, now, this is fairly solid in here, but I'm quite pedantic, so I'm going to go with a second one. And let's just pop the arm in so that's ready to go. So let me do this where you can see it. Um, yep, pop that in there. Tighten it. Get the suction mount on. Yep, that's going to reach from there. Is this going to play nice like we wanted it, like the other one did? Ah, oh, happy days. And then let's just get this arm connected to the bottom here. Actually, we might want to adjust this a little bit. Yep. Screw that in. I know this is riveting viewing, right? I should probably fast forward this bit. 
and now that ain't going nowhere so this is what our two angles look like and you can see there's our main angle now i would need to change some adjustments and one little tip or little trick that i've learned is don't have the camera that is on the screen don't have that set to autofocus because when you put your hand in front of the screen the camera is going to focus on your hand instead of being focused on the screen so what you want to do is or at least what i do with this is i set it to autofocus get it on the screen and then i use the flick on the there's a little button on the camera to change it to manual focus and then i just use this zoom to scale function so that zooms in on the actual screen and you can adjust how much of a zoom you want. And then I will set up the manual focus just like that. And there we go. We are now, oh, is that, see my eyes are not very good. And in focus. Yep, I reckon that's about as good as we're going to get it. So then turn the zoom scale off. And there we go. We're now focused on the screen. But that screen's a little bit too bright, I reckon. And so now here's the challenge. What if I want to make that screen darker? Because the screen actually is a little bit too bright in the camera. I could go into displays here and I could try and adjust the brightness of the display. And that kind of works, actually. That... That, that, that actually works quite well. So you could do that, but to my natural eye, I'm struggling to see what's going on there with the screen. So I'm just going to reset that to auto. Again, that's going to be too bright. So what you can do is you can put sunglasses on your camera. So this is what's called a neutral density filter or an ND filter. And how it works, now this is a variable one, so I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but as I turn this, it gets darker and brighter through the screen now you're not going to be able to see that but what i can do is i can just put one of these on there but if i just put it in front of there you can see there that has now adjusted now that's too dark so i could make that lighter or, or not as dark and you can you know obviously make adjustments so and so if you want to keep the camera settings a particular way because you want a particular look but it's too bright have a look at nd or particularly variable nd filters in fact i've got one on the camera that's looking at me right now um, to adjust the brightness of the screen and get your get, get get the way the screen looks so that is how i am filming with the panasonic bs1h's in the car at the moment it's a really good setup it works really well um, the fact that i can remote control multiple cameras is really the biggest selling point because you know if i'm doing a long drive i can pull over and really quickly just hit record record and get going or pull over change a couple of settings record record and away i go and just that not having to lean over and change things and lean back and change things that in itself is a really good selling point the challenge there though is that's not just exclusive for these particular cameras that works with any of the panasonic lumix cameras and there comes the challenge so you might be watching this going well lee are you going to sell all your sony stuff and move across to panasonic no, I'm not. I'm way too heavily invested in Sony. But I could see some Panasonics in my future because I'd be perfectly happy to buy a couple of Panasonic cameras and use them just exclusively for my car stuff because just being able to control them, that alone is worth it. Now, am I going to get a couple of these cameras, a couple of the BS1Hs? Probably not. And I'll explain to you why. The things I really love about the BS1Hs um, is the form factor. So the fact that they're so small and compact and light, they're really easy to stuff in a nook or a cranny or, you know, and cars, you need small light cameras so you can get them into various different spots. Um, the fact that they've got connection points all around, really like that. I don't put a cage, make them bigger, bulkier, and so on. The things that I don't think fit well to my use case though is first of all they're not cheap so at the moment in july 2023 they're four grand each um and they're worth that because they have really fantastic specs like they will do actually up to eight i, I just remember they actually do, i think they do up to 8k so 8k 6k 5k they're really high-end cameras and i don't need that high-end stuff i just need up to 4k 5k maybe i might use it at some point um so i don't need those high-end specs for the price 
also the autofocus whilst good is not great and particularly panasonic's just panasonic's actually done themselves not that much favor with this particular thing because they've just come out with a new camera called the lumix it's either s 52 or the 5s2 and that's got phenomenal autofocus on it so and it's cheaper than the bs1h's of course so i could see a couple of those mark ii or the mark ii x's in my future and i'd be very keen once i give these back to panasonic to say hey can you do me a deal on on a couple of those and some lenses because i think it would be nice to have right panasonic those are my in car and out those are my car cameras so when i'm shooting car stuff the panasonic ones because they're really easy to control i i cannot stress how great the remote control that lumix app is always room for improvement but compared to other manufacturers apps that allow you to remote various different things with the cameras lumix head and shoulders above so yeah that's my conclusion i hope this video was helpful i hope it was useful um I hope it's something that my audience would be interested in. If you'd like me to do a few more like that, I won't do a lot, but if you'd like me to do a couple of other ones, like looking at lighting or, or focus more on audio, let me know and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, if you didn't find it interesting, you're like, oh, can you just go back to what you normally do? Let me know in the comments as well and I'll go back to what I normally do. Uh, yeah, so if you have found this useful or helpful or beneficial in any way any value that is brought to you please like and subscribe if you have already subscribed thank you so much for your support and we'll uh, catch you on the next one safe and happy driving please let that be the last take i have to do my hdmi cable i'll just turn this on um if i'd brought a battery which i didn't you schmuck i'm not starting again i'll tell you that for free and for nothing no nope, battery uh, i grabbed a flat battery i'm so good at what i do not particularly okay let's go grab a battery that's not flat you schmuck See again this 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 is what happens when you try and do everything by yourself. You, stuff gets missed. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing? So yeah, so you oh god, see this is it's that's just so rubbish. I ah uh, what am I doing? What am I doing? This is why we need to script things. I had it, I had it, I had it all going in my head.